Your blessing, Father. My question is about grace. I know you've talked about this many times before, Father, but can you give a brief explanation of what grace is exactly and how we acquire it? There was an incident where I had mentioned there is no grace outside the Orthodox Church, and someone was scandalized by my comment and assumed I had said there is no salvation outside the Orthodox Church. When I told that person that I said grace, not salvation, they basically said it's the same thing. This person is Orthodox, and to be honest, the conversation didn't end well. He is a convert and has family that repose outside the Orthodox Church and basically took that as opportunity to tell me that what I said is wrong by church standards and teachings. Your input on this matter would be much appreciated, Father. All right. So let's start with the definition of terms here. Grace. Well, grace literally means gift in Greek. Ichari is to thu, right? Chari is to be a gift. It's a gift from God. But what does God give? He gives himself. So grace is God himself. It's the what we call the divine energies. We oftentimes refer to the grace of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit, and we mean the divine energies of God that are that are sent and we communicate and we commune with God in his divine energies. So this is divinity. We're communing with divinity. So grace is God himself, the presence of God. And it's not something created. It's uncreated. It's God himself. So that's the first thing. Secondly, when he said it's basically the same thing, he's, he's right and wrong at the same time. So is there grace outside the church? Well, is God's presence outside the church? Yes and no. Of course he's present everywhere and fills all things, right? We say that prayer every day, don't we? We should. O heavenly king, O comforter, the spirit of truth, who fills all, who are everywhere present and fills all things, treasury of blessings, giver of life, okay? So life, creation, our existence itself, no matter who you are, is predicated upon the presence of the grace of God. Nothing exists, nothing operates in creation without the grace of God. All right, so he's everywhere present and fills all things. So what's the difference? Why become an Orthodox Christian? Because the divine energies, the actions or operations of the grace of God are not the same for everyone. There are presuppositions. Learn that term. It's very important. Everybody needs to understand everything has presuppositions. We presuppose things. We don't always name them, but we know they're there. And we know that they have to be there for that other thing to be real and fruitful and all the rest. All right, so grace exists here and there. There's a difference, though. Is there a difference in grace? Yes and no. It's the same Holy Spirit, same presence, but the operations, the actions, the activity is different based on the presuppositions. And what is that? When you enter the church, when you embrace Christ in the church, you are baptized, chrismated, and communed, then the divine energies or operations or presence of God as purification, illumination, and glorification, those things which sanctify, those things which happen in the mysteries, those that presence of God is only in the church. Because it presupposes your free desire and, and acceptance of God. It presupposes you not that, that he's knocking, but you open the door. So until you open the door, and that means baptism, he's still knocking. He's there, but you got to open the door, right? So that's the grace that you get when you open the door. You get purification, illumination. You get the whole process of, of being purified and illumined and sanctified and glorified in your communion with God. That doesn't happen outside the church. It's very clear in, in the fathers that that does not happen outside the church. Now, you might not like that, friend. But that's the reality. That's the patristic mind. And it's it's summed up and it's quoted again and again and again. This quote is, is, is everywhere. You can find it online. Uh, I could even probably find it online and let's read it. Let's, let me do that so that you can see it. All right. I want everybody to see this. So let me go and see if I can find it real quick online. 
Now I'm sharing this page with you. All right, so <clears throat> this is <clears throat> this is the from the Philokalia. This is from the Philokalia. Can't get more orthodox than the Philokalia, right? And this is a great saint, a niptic father, who's talking about grace before and after baptism. What does he say? Some have imagined that both grace and sin, that is the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, are hidden at the same time in the intellect, the noose, of the baptized. As a result, they say, one of these two spirits urges the intellect to good and the other to evil. But from Holy Scripture and through the intellect's noose, his, the noose's own sight, insight, I'm sorry, I have come to understand things differently. Before holy baptism, grace encourages the soul towards good from the outside. Before baptism, grace is outside the soul. It encourages from the outside, where while Satan lurks in its depths, trying to block all the intellect's ways of approach to the divine. But from the moment that we are reborn through baptism, the demon now is outside, and grace is within. Thus, whereas before baptism, error ruled the soul, after baptism, truth rules the soul. Nevertheless, even after baptism, Satan still acts on the soul, often indeed to a greater degree than before. How's that work? Of course, everybody who's an Orthodox Christian who's struggling knows that the temptations and the struggle happens to, to them more after baptism, not less, right? But it's different. It's from the outside, not from the inside. <clears throat> This is not because he is present in the soul together with grace. On the contrary, it is because he uses the body's humors to befog the noose with the delight of mindless pressures. So now he comes and he's outside and he titillates the senses and he tries to get you to give, give yourself over through the senses. That's why there's so much focus in St. Nicodemus and other writers on the senses to protect your senses, to guard your senses, right? Because that's the avenue by which the devil now works to bring you into sin. God allows him to do this so that a man, after passing through a trial of storm and fire, may come in the end to the fulfillment of divine blessings. He allows that for us. And that's why the saints say, oh my gosh, if I don't have temptation, God has abandoned me. Did you know that? That's what they say in the Yerodikon. It is a normal state of a Christian to have external, not internal, but external temptations, problems, uh, challenges, not because they want it, but because it's allowed by God. Okay, there's a difference. If you bring it upon yourself, God's not at fault. But if, if you walk according to God and things come at you, then that is normal. For it is written, we went through fire and water, and thou hast brought us into a place where the soul is refreshed. As we have said, from the instant we are baptized, grace is hidden in the depths of the intellect, the noose, concealing its presence, even from the perception of the noose itself. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. Concealing its presence, even from the, presence of the, the perception of the noose itself. Even the noose, your intellect does not perceive the grace that is hidden in the depths from the moment that we are baptized. When someone begins, however, to love God with full resolve, then, in a mysterious way, by means of the noose's perception, grace communicates something of its riches to its soul. This is exactly what I was taught by my elders and my fathers in Greece. And, El and, and Professor Chalangidis would go on and on about this. That what, what is, what's got to happen here is that the love of God has to fire up in the soul. And then what happens is that kingdom of God which has been given, that grace, the, the presence of God which has been given, and it's mysterious, hidden in you, it starts to manifest itself. And all of that garbage that you've been feeding your soul starts to come out, and you just have to smell the stench, right? You're being purified. You're going through this purification process. Then, if he really wants to hold fast to this discovery, he joyfully starts longing to be rid of all his temporal goods so as to acquire the field in which he has, not, has found the hidden treasure of life. Of course, we're talking about the Lord's re a reference to the, 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 the field in which the treasure is hidden. 
And that's the heart. That's the soul. This is because when someone rids himself of all worldly riches, and he doesn't mean just money here. He's talking about pursuits and loves and all the rest, right? When you rid yourself of all that, you're not living for that. He discovers the place where the grace of God is hidden. For as the soul advances, divine grace more and more reveals itself to the intellect. The noose. Not the rational. Not the rational intellect. Not the dhyanya. The noose. During this process, however, the Lord allows the soul to be pestered increasingly by demons. The Lord allows that. Don't be afraid. Don't be sad. It's God's hand that you have these, these temptations coming from without. This is to teach it to discriminate, to discern. See, discernment only comes through experience, brothers and sisters. You have to have a struggle to become discerning. To discriminate, to discern correctly between good and evil and to make it more humble through the deep shame it feels during its purification because of the way in which it defiled, it is defiled by demonic thoughts. Pay attention here. The shame that we feel is a part of the purification process. It's a sign that we're being purified. Read that again with me. This is to, this this struggle that is allowed is to, dis, to teach discernment so that we know and discern the spirits. This is the sign of an Orthodox Christian. You can discern the spirits. This does not exist anywhere but in the church. And to make it more humble through the deep shame it feels during its purification because of the way in which it's, it is defiled by demonic thoughts. We should feel that deep shame and it humbles us extremely. And we should pray for that. Lord, humble me exceedingly. Humble me exceedingly that I might see myself and who I am. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to see yourself, to see your sins, to see your passions. So, grace is everywhere, but it's not the same outside and the same inside. So what happens to those who never entered the church? We don't know. It's not ours to judge. It's God's to judge, and he'll deal with that. But we cannot say they have the grace of the church. We cannot say they have the grace of purification, illumination, and deification. 